and let them go. It's not an excuse to use, though people do use it like that sometimes. Or when you're wide awake thinking that you smell it somewhere when it's nowhere around. There is that too. Yes, that happens. I've heard that's really common. Yeah. Wait, and that's your body saying that it's one of. One of the deepest, oh, okay, so just to repeat that in case Cottage Grove or whoever didn't hear that, part of, part of the recovery process is not just simply you having using dreams. You could be just going along your day and all of a sudden smell like you smell the drug or something. So that can happen just in your memory because the sense of smell is part of lizard brain. Okay? It is one of the oldest senses that we have, and boom, yeah, you can have a um, olfactory hallucination. Olfactory meaning smell. You smell certain things. Now, I'm a drug counselor, so I'm like cynical and suspicious. Is also just as likely that somebody around you is on meth and you can smell them, you have a characteristic detoxing smell, not you, but them. There are enough people walking around where I'm... Ugh. Right? I've been in groups before where one person smelled it and nobody else in the entire group did, and they'd all done it before. I mean, yeah, it's like a... I mean, okay, I've personally experienced it. Yeah. You're just walking along and something triggers the feeling of... Like, I smoked pot and I was like 19 for like yeah. a whole year yeah. and got a really good job, and so I obviously stopped. Yeah. And... Um, I don't know what triggered it, maybe like boredom or whatever, but I suddenly smelt it like everywhere and nobody around me. I was like smelling pot for like, I'm like it's so strong, like yeah. you can't smell right. that. Right. Nobody smelt it. And, right. then, and then I'm like, okay, I did have a stressful day, maybe. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Just so or, or you walked by a particular strain of azaleas. I mean, that also <laughs> happens too, where, you know, it smells like bud. But that's not yeah. the first time I've yeah. heard it, you know. But yeah. People can have olfactory hallucinations, <coughs> auditory hallucinations, flashbacks can happen. Fla basically, their memory, right? And who knows what triggers them? We're not sure. Yeah. <coughs> what was interesting about it was when nobody, when everyone said that they didn't smell it, I couldn't smell it anymore. As if I was telling myself it's not real, and then I couldn't smell it. Yeah. It's almost like you. You like when you're waking up from a dream, you think it's still real and you think you can still experience it. And then as soon as you visualize yourself in your room, your brain tells yourself that you're awake, you're not there anymore, and then you suddenly can't, like, you're not experiencing your dream anymore. It's kind yeah. of like a weird transition. <laughs> yes. On the individual, and, and what you're talking about is a, a phenomenon of the nervous system. On the individual nerve cell, the neuron level, the individual neuron cannot tell the difference between a real event and an imagined <coughs> event. It's the same. Or a remembered event. It's all the same on the individual level. So where the decision is made in those higher brain functions is, is what is this? Is this a memory? Am I really experiencing this? Or actually you can even future trip. Is this about to happen? Or will it happen sometime in the future? Two. What part of the brain can't tell that? The individual nerve cell. But basically, since you've got 100 billion of them, and they all may be involved in memory, you know, it's collectively where you decide where, what the category <coughs> is of what you're experiencing. Psychoneuroimmunology, which is the relationship between mind, mood, and immune response. Long 20 cent word talks about that. So when your mood is up, your immune system is up. If your mood is down, your immune system efficiency goes down. So this is an example of what Candace is talking about, that your body is your subconscious mind. Consciously is where you have thoughts. 
It's kind of like it's above the water. Subconsciously, it's below the water. And sometimes you can see underwater, sometimes you have to listen. Or use other senses other than sight. So because, for example, the orchestrators of the immune system are like white blood cells, and these make neurotransmitters as well, if your mood is up, they, op they function optimally. If your mood is down, they don't function as well. That's without drugs. Certain <coughs> drugs, like when you get stoned, okay, your immune system gets stoned too. Really, literally does. Particularly in organ systems and cells that have a high fat content. And what I mean by fat, all cells in the body have fat, fat, if you know your anatomy and physiology, all of them. But certain cells have more fat than others. So not just your fat cells, all cells have fat. So those cells happen to be high energy organs like your heart, your lungs, your brains, ovaries and testes, and immune cells. And so THC lodges in those cell walls and one of the reasons that THC takes so long to get from the body is basically you're oversaturated. So part of the THC quit process is not only REM rebound, that is you start remembering your dreams in two to three days after not using, but maybe within four days to a week you get a cold. Because your immune system has been stoned from the time that you've gotten stoned and, oh, wow, look at all these bacteria. Who let the dogs in? No, the bacteria in. Um, yeah. So when people like detox, like drink certain things to get marijuana out of their system right. for like a short amount of time, how does that work? Oh, well, that just, well, to the degree that it works, which I'm not certain that it does, yeah. but... You know, the belief system is it does, and you know, some people say, well, it does work. Okay, yeah. whatever. So all that's doing is excreting from that level of detection. Because you're usually doing that so that you can pee, right? So it's a relatively short turnaround, because it doesn't stop the, the marijuana or the THC byproducts from, or metabolites technically, uh, from being excreted, it just stops it from urine temporarily. Still in your system. Yeah. So, immune system response is affected by drug intake, in particular, certain mind or mood altering chemicals. Marijuana is only one of them. <coughs> but others too, depending on how toxic they are. Right? Your immune system response is assisted by fitness, exercise, and emotional, mental, and spiritual exercise, including uh, meditation, crossword puzzles, you know, flexing your brain muscles, sitting down, being still, so that's why in uh, recovery systems, a holistic recovery says, okay, hydrate, you know, at least a gallon of water if you weigh 200 pounds. What is it? The formula was uh, half your body weight in ounces. So if you weigh 200 pounds, then 100 ounces, which is a little less than a gallon. You know, uh, fitness, exercise, basically to oxygenate the brain, get the blood flow circulating. So for example, the food moods are coming in. After tracking what I put in my mouth, I'm reminded of the importance of mindful ingestion. I seem to go through spurts of awareness. There are times when I'm fully cognizant of what I put in my mouth or take into my body and others where I tune out and yield to lazy, inattentive consumption. The moments when I ingest unhealthy foods or drinks seem to be done in a late, hazy trance, much the same way 
and most addictions take hold in an unaware state. So again, when, when she was talking about essentially is, you know, you're lazy or not so much lazy but bored, so eating becomes a form of entertainment, you're not aware of what's going on and the part of you that basically indulges in that can be overridden by angel brain where you can say, instead of eating, let me hydrate and take a walk. Or hydrate, take a walk and hydrate some more. Or do something else. Because what do I, maybe I just need to feed my spirit and not my body. Maybe I need to do something else. How do you increase your awareness? So, most addictions take hold in an unaware state. So, prevention is practicing that which makes you strong, and that takes awareness. So, self-awareness, environmental awareness, empowerment, which mean, literally means power within mind. So, you're accessing the power within. Mind is kind of like the spirit of awareness within matter. And self-mastery, that is mastering yourself, not being mastered by others, uh, also gives you the ability to determine what direction you're going to go. These are all functions of angel brain. So when we talk about why teaching self-mastery, so it's a condition that leads to freedom or liberation in any circumstance. So, liberation from fear, where fear stems from ignorance of yourself. So, for example, one client once said, first they break your wagon. She's talking about her inner child, right? So, first they break your wagon, then they sell you the tools to fix it. Except the tools that they give you to fix it mean that you keep having to go back to them to fix it. Well, what if... We taught you, or they taught you, to create your own wagon or live as if you were indigenous. That is, you're in your body and you know it better. You're interdependent, and so you're contributing to and being supported by your environment. So this principle is found within what we call, uh, in English, community-defined evidence. That is, bodies of knowledge found within specific communities. Right? That may not be studied by universities or governments, but are just part of communities that have organized and uh, remain separate from that. So, as an example, when I was showing you bonobos the other day, and that our genome most closely matches bonobos, particularly in the link in conflict resolution that is resolved by orgasm chemicals, creating bonding or resolving conflict. So one of the cha- so it's not just about makeup sex. Why does makeup sex work? But on the other hand, how can sex become addictive? So rather than talk about so the problems, because those are problems, addic- you know, sex addiction, porn, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, who talks about sex in a healthy way? Where does that come from? Who, which community does that? So when I was talking about, oh, how do you have a parenting license? Well, that all, almost, all, you know, what, what about having a parenting license like when you have the talk? You know what I mean by the talk for your parents, you know? How was the talk given to you? How was the talk given to you? Did you get the talk? Hmm, no. So, how is it that we have a culture where we're using sex to sell toothpaste and computers and cars, but people know more about programming their cell phones than their bodies? Who designed that kind of outcome? 
Yeah. My talk was interesting. I was 18 my senior year, and we'd never had any sort of conversation about it. It was just known that I wasn't doing it up until now. And I've been with the same guy since... It the, was known that you weren't doing it? It was known, yes. Okay. All I was right. a virgin. I was with the same guy for the last week of freshman year all the way to past high school. But this, at this point, <coughs> I'm in the middle of my senior year. And my mom starts to get worried because I haven't yet. Hmm. We haven't had the sex talk yet. But she's starting to get worried because I haven't. Because she's worried. She's having this conversation with me in the car. She's worried that... I'm going, we're going to break up and then I'm going to end up sleeping with someone who doesn't care about me and she wanted my first time to be with someone who loved me. This guy was a great guy. I mean, he did love me. <coughs> we had a great, extremely healthy relationship. So she decided that he was the one that I should give myself to. We didn't have any sort of a marriage talk or there was no real actual sex talk about how it happens or why or when. She just basically started going into how I should maybe start considering it, and then I had to finally stop her and say, well, I did, I, I already did. Like, it had happened, like, within months of this talk before. And then there was just, like, uncomfortable silence yes. for, like, the rest of the trip, which happened to be really long. <laughs> and then we Ooh. just never spoke of it again. Until eight months later, when she just all of a sudden started asking me, "You don't do it in the house, do you?" She, she <laughs> never done it in my car, have you? Well, where do you? Never mind. I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, mom, we're moving out together <laughs> the school year. I mean, <laughs> it was very awkward. I had multiple conversations my entire growing up about basically. Don't go anywhere by yourself or you're going to get raped sort of mm -hmm. talks because mm -hmm. obviously mm -hmm. she had bad experiences, we'll call it. We had many women's intuition conversations from the time I was so little that in my kindergarten class, all of the girls were molested by me because I were what? molested. Yeah. I told my mom my teacher looks at me funny. She assumed I meant my female teacher and really it was my school bus driver coming and molesting all of the girls with me. And so I had women's information <coughs> about people and circumstances and gut, going off your gut. We talked about that my whole life, but sex itself was never even talked about until after I already did it. Yeah. So it was interesting. <laughs> and if you've compared notes, how common is that experience? What's that? If you've compared notes with other women, how common is that experience? Um, pretty common. Hmm. And... I mean, well, my dad wasn't in my life a lot, but he, when I was around him, he would tell the most vulgar stories I've ever heard in my entire life, with full knowledge that I was in the room. Sometimes <coughs> it's not about me or about sex directly talking to me, but they were just discussing me vulgar. So I had both sides of the spectrum. My dad never had the talk with me either, but he was just so incredibly crude. I'd heard so much and. My mom was so incredibly crude, I just didn't understand how they were ever together, for one thing. I mean, so it was so definitely two, two poles of the, of, the of the spectrum, crude and, my and crude. my mom was pregnant with me at graduation. Not showing, but she was pregnant. And so I think it was my senior year and she started to, you know, yeah. graduation was coming and she was pregnant at hers, so right. I guess she decided that it was after prom, yeah, it does. <laughs> Okay, right. So um, the reason this is coming up here now, it's a recovery issue. Sex is a recovery issue, All right? This is college, we're adults. And whether we're parents or not, often we parent the way we were parented and maybe if we have a choice before we're parents, being able to develop the skills to talk about certain things that are going to come up, as it were. Yeah, my mom had that talk with me after I was 18, and my dad's only sex advice I got was, well, you know, the best way to get over one is to get under another. <laughs> that was my sex yeah. advice. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever talk about birth control at all? Or did um, you have it at school? Because we had ours at school. And... No. 
I, I chose to take like peer pages. mediation instead of a lot of required classes that were the same category, same credit. Yeah. So I got out of things creatively. But they didn't yeah. like give it away at the nurse's office or anything? Not that I was aware. We didn't talk about it. Do they at school anymore? It's so no, crazy so. in schools like now. Like my little brother just turned 14 and he had his first girlfriend this summer and they were doing it and they he didn't even know how to use a condom properly. I That's mean, what said. Yeah. And she didn't know what birth control was. I so I took them both to Planned Parenthood. I knew enough that I, mean, I have sex classes but in school, but it doesn't teach you how to well, no, when you're that young, use a condom or getting. go get birth control, you know? And, uh, 